Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Can everybody hear me as well uh, in virtual space? Awesome. Very, very good. Well, good morning. I'm going to try again. Good morning. Yay. Good morning. <laughs> I'm good morning. Denise good morning. Oh, awesome. The, the, the sounds are coming. That's great. Um, I am Denise Martinez. I am the interim associate vice president of the University of Iowa Healthcare System and associate dean of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it is so nice to see you all. Um, and it just is bringing me life this morning, seeing people in humanness. It, it makes a big difference. And actually, we were just reminiscing that the last thing I did right before the end of the pandemic was the LMSA National Conference. We had that and then we went into pandemic mode and the first thing back is LMSA National Conference. So I think this is a very, very good full circle moment. Um, and so we're just going to do a little bit of a reflection about yesterday and some of the things that we learned uh, through this programming and then uh, introduce our next uh, set of speakers. Um, but I guess I just wanted to um, say, you know, thank you so much for being here. And uh, I, I know for myself personally, LMSA has meant a great deal to me. Um, I too, I know Dr. Betancourt mentioned this earlier today, but I was one of those students of uh, first doctor in my family um, who um, was told by my undergraduate institution that I would never be a doctor. And then um, I ended up doing a pipeline summer program now called SHPEP. And uh, when Dr. David Acosta was in his first year as Dean at the University of Washington School of Medicine and Diversity, this was over 20 years ago now, <laughs> and uh, was told that I could do this. And every time that I get to be in this space and then Obviously, when I was in medical school without LMSA, I don't think that I would have survived. Having that level of community and doing this type of work, you know, makes all of the difference for our students. And then many of you who have significant, you know, leadership, you know, both in your medical schools and in hospitals and other community spaces makes a big difference just in general for our community. So thank you so much. Uh, that's all really important. Um, so yesterday, there are some amazing speakers, different paths, talking about the different opportunities how to enhance your CV, how to be on the different tracks towards promotion. I just realized I had my mask on. I'm going to take this off right now. Um, how to, uh, you know, tenure track versus non-tenure track, all of those important things as we're figuring out how to navigate these systems, especially in academic medicine, which is so very important. Today, we have the opportunity to learn from deans of medical schools, and I hope more of us will continue to pursue that path because there hasn't been enough of us who've done it. And so, uh, hopefully, more of us will continue in that space. And uh, I would love to hear, does anybody have any reflections? This is the, this is the community part of this session. Anybody want to say anything that they've learned, something that they've, you know, that say has meant to them? I'm going to wait awkwardly until somebody says something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we have microphones. And also, feel free to put in the chat for those who are virtual. <laughs> yes, Dr. Vela. <laughs> for me, um, LMSA has always been the space where I come to see myself reflected back. Mm. Um, to mm -hmm. be lifted and to lift and um, to recognize that um, the words that I hear as I walk past people in small group conversations, I can always hear the, si se puede. Yes. Yes, you can. Yes. You can reach, you can ask, um, you can do, you can lift. And so this has always been an empowering space. Yes. Love it. Yes. <laughs> Oh, oh, in the back, in the back. <laughs> uh, I second all the words that Dr. Vela say. Um, my background is a little bit different. I am a PhD in immunology, but I am the faculty advisor for LSU, Louisiana State University. And be part of the LMSA has been an incredible experience because that helped me to understand what is going on and how can I project everything that I have learned here with the LMSA to my students mm -hmm. in LSU. 
but more importantly, and I hope that we have the time to talk about this, is that now that I am part of the LMSA and, 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 and as an advisor, I, have, I am from Colombia, South America, and I have at least six physicians in Colombia that want to be part of this. And I tell, of course, be a member, become a member. And those are people who really want to come to the United States, not to stay in the United States, but get the taste of how medicine is here in the United States and how what they learn here in the United States can be applied in our countries in South America. So I think that that will be a very important point that uh, uh, it will be nice to discuss uh, during, during the term of this, of this uh, Congress. Yeah, no, fair enough. Fair enough. Thank you. Yes. It's my, it's my brother. Yeah, my name is Fernando Mendoza. Okay. And, and uh, I guess my reflection comes from being, as I talked to my compadre over here, an affirmative action uh, student in 1971. Um, and then uh, becoming faculty at Stanford in 1981 and dean in 1983. So being uh, now emeritus professor, emeritus dean. At the end of the day, you know, um, I, I look at the last uh, 50 years and we've made improvements, but they haven't been enough. And part of that is a result of being uh, in some degree, isolated, working by ourselves, rather than working with each other as a network. And I give great thanks to JP and the whole group for making us a network at the time that this nation needs one yes. for Latinos. Yes. Uh, you know, we have been peripheral within the discussions of minorities and minorities this and that. We're now becoming more central. But overall, minorities are no longer peripheral, they're central. Half of all the children, my pediatrician, mm -hmm. half of all the kids in the United States are minority. In 2040, equal numbers of Latino children in the whole country and white kids. So, you know, medicine has to deal with the reality, the science, the data that shows that you cannot train a generation of physicians that are either researchers, clinicians, educators, administrators, without understanding Latinos and other uh, African-Americans. All of our centers exist in communities that speak at least 100 languages. So the issue is now that this is a, not an issue for us, it's the issue for academic medicine. And as such, we need to help them find the way. We need to help them find that way by finding not just the ideas, but the leaders that will help them move us in that direction. So this is why this meeting is so critical. It's 50 years. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's 50 years of effort. So it's not like, you know, we don't, belong we haven't paid the the tuition to be here so to speak the issue is what do we do next and i think it's not my generation anymore it's the generations behind us that we need to make sure get there as a viejito you know my my thing is to <laughs> say it's not to say well in my day it's to say let me think about how I can help you today in your day. No, fair enough, fair enough. My compadre. <laughs> I think we have time for one more, yes. Now, Dr. De La Rosa. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me build on the, on the, on the shoulders of uh, my viejito and uh, speak as a real viejo viejo. Um, LMSA has, has a unique opportunity right now. Um, and and I, I do recognize that this is a challenge, but I wanted to speak up during this portion of the of the 50 year celebration to look to the future, because this portion of the 50 year celebration is the future. Mm -hmm. 
what's been lacking in in the movement is a network of faculty. Yeah. Okay. And we've tried through other organizations to build that network. It hasn't happened. Um, it hasn't been sustainable. But I think I think JP found a way to get us all together. And and the concept of leaders is precisely that a network of Hispanic faculty, of Latinx faculty that helps each other. Yes. And I think that is the future, not only for LMSA, but for the entire country. Because viejitos, viejotes, <laughs> like us, worked in isolation for many, many, many years. Whether it was in Texas, in Chicago, in Boston, Wherever we were, we were seen as leaders, but unicos. We were the only ones. But now I look around and I see people my kids' age who are assistant and associate professors all across the country. They have exactly the same questions that we did. We have a vice president at the AAMC who's almost a little bit of a viejito. <laughs> <laughs> almost. Okay. We have people in key positions that can help everybody across the country lead the country. Because Fernando is absolutely right. We are the future of the country. They're going to look like us. Mm -hmm. Our sons, daughters are going to come. Some of them are in medical school already. And I want to see them improve. Yeah. I don't want to see them recreate exactly the same experiences that we had. And so leaders, thanks to JP's leadership, yes, pun intended, <laughs> is the future not only of LMSA, but of Hispanic healthcare in, in the country. So Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, that was awesome. So thank you. Um, so that's a perfect transition to our next session. So our next session is a national perspective on LHS plus leadership in U.S. medical schools. So perfect, perfect timing. And I get to introduce uh, Dr. Monica Vela, who is the director of the Hispanic Center for Excellence and a professor in internal medicine at the University of Illinois, Chicago of Medicine, who I admire greatly. Thank you. So welcome everyone. I am so excited for this session. We have uh, just a remarkable group of people to help lead us and help us think about how we're going to shape this national perspective. How are we um, going to help the rest of the world and the United States in particular um, to see us um, and to see what we have to offer? We have three leaders today. Um, and I can't imagine how hard it was to get all three of them in one space at one time, but kudos to JP again. First, we have Dr. David Ocosta. He is a family medicine physician and the chief diversity and inclusion officer for the American Association of Medical Colleges. We have Dr. Robert Kane, a pulmonary medicine specialist and the president and CEO of the American Association of Osteopathic Medicine, and Dr. Bill McDade, a trained anesthesiologist, researcher, and the inaugural chief diversity and inclusion, um, uh, sorry, the inaugural chief diversity and inclusion officer for the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education. Um, we'll hear from each of them, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. So please start preparing those in your mind. We don't want to waste um, this opportunity to speak to these three, three leaders. Thank you. Dr. Acosta. Well, good morning, everyone. So good to be here. And, and I'm still getting over the uh, how unrealistic this is in the sense that we've been away from this for two years and to see you in person, to see my fellow viejitos in person, <laughs> uh, give each other hugs is something unbelievable uh, and how much we've missed it. So again, thank you all for being present. Thank you for those of you that are joining us um, as well. Um, 
But I got to point out something that was in the chat that I don't know if it caught people's eyes, but I thought this was great that I want to start this session with. And it said, this is church, Dr. Mendoza. <laughs> Did you see that? I thought that was excellent sort of thing, too. So I have the distinct pleasure of uh, representing the AAMC with regards to what are we talking about? What's the perspective of us looking at now the shortages that we are up against um, and challenged by, and especially uh, at the times where we're divided as a nation with regards to how important or the lack of importance of diversity may be when we have active movement out there to try to destroy and take away the DEI training, calling everything anti-CRT. This is our moment, as Manny was mentioning, because I think this is, again, we need that collective voice. You know, Juntos is, is all about, it takes a village for us to make that change. And this is our moment. And again, we can't blow at this time. Uh, there's many been some wonderful efforts in the past that was led by many of the people in this room that have come and gone. But I think the momentum right now through the notion of that is, is really important. So again, I thank JP. I thank the team that has been working on this for such a long time. The strength of LMSA after 50 years is really important as well. So my hope is today is uh, to run you through Sorry, JP, just trying to see if I've got the right ways to advance things. Ah, thank you. That just shows how much of a heat I'm really in when I can't even figure out the technology that's kind of there as well. So thank you for that. Um, so, again, just to recap kind of what our agenda is today for each of the, uh, the panel members is that um, our hope is to, can we highlight some of the rationale for why to enhance our LHS uh, plus leadership and why we need that, but also identify what are some of those challenges. People call them challenges. I call them inhibitors that are preventing us from getting in these particular positions that we really need to begin talking truth, being in truth to power as well, because I think now what's different today than has been in the years that we've been working on this is that I think we have a, uh, we're, we're starting to develop this solidarity around voice that we have. And we have this chance that we're collective, collectively moving forward and have people listen, which I think is important. But those inhibitors are not just for faculty. We got to remember our trajectory, our journey for this. This happens even in the pre-health and the K through 12 years as well. And I think most of us are tired of it, you know, because we thought, well, things will get better, you know, as we ascend the ladder. And even some of us in leadership positions at some of our institutions think that we'll make this impactful change, but then come face to face with an inhibitor. So I think it's important to talk about that today as well. Secondly, let's talk about opportunities. Let's quit talking about the challenges and inhibitors. But what are some of the opportunities that even from yesterday, I was really amazed how many people don't know about all the opportunities that are out there or even how to access them. I found that a problem with all of our associations. I follow like, with the schools. It's not a blame game thing. It's, it's more about how do we disseminate this so that all of our students, all of our residents, all of our fellows, our early career faculty really know clearly, you know, where's the repository that I can go to? And I think that is as well equipped for that as well as some for associations. And then last but not least, so my hope is at least how can we stimulate the dialogue amongst ourselves in order to basically promote the advancement of our LHS positive leaders uh, with an academic medicine. And I think it has to be at four different levels that we have to think about this. At least that's how I think. And that is at the individual level, at the group level, as we come together, at the institutional level, because in many instances, this is a local thing. And then last but not least, what role does organized medicine play out in this? We've never really called in our so academic societies that we have for each of our specialties and subspecialties to take a role in this. Because they felt, I, I think they've always felt, well, we'll let somebody else do it. We don't need to do this sort of a thing. And I think it's time to really change that, that uh, mindset and that narrative as well. So what I don't want to do is, again, a I, I, big shout out to Dr. Paul Hunter uh, and uh, Dr. Sanchez yesterday for going through a lot of the data. A lot of people have come up to me and said, are we going to have access to that data? Because that's really helped for us to create the narrative back home. And I think the answer JP, if I got that right, that the answer is yes, for sure. So I don't want to belabor it um, um, and, and repeat some of that stuff, but I'll just emphasize a couple of things. And, and again, I think, um, you know, the reality is that 
what we're just trying to depict is things are changing. And so one of the rationales is, again, the change of demographics, as Manny had said perfectly, is that it's not only in helping our advisors, our, our leaders that are presently in our medical schools now and institutions um, to get ready. Don't be left behind because Latinos have to be at the table to help you. How are you going to navigate when there's majority? On a side, we got to start changing the language. And I think it starts with us and quit calling ourselves minority. We have to have an alternative language name for that because, again, that's in my mind now that I realize it, been used to calling myself a minority all these years, but it's condescending. And I think what we need to do if we're going to advance ourselves, we have to change that language. I think is really important too. But again, just to highlight, and again, uh, thanks to uh, thanks to Fernanda who constantly reminds me when I say, you know, we talked about yesterday about um, the rising population uh, demographics being predominantly Latino in the United States as well. That ultimately by 2035. Right now, we're one in six, one in every six people in the United States is Latino, and we're going to be shooting to one in four. And I remember, Fernando, I always hear your voice that says, David, we're already there with our kids, K through 12. So wake up. And, I, and so I want to call you out publicly for that because that's a wonderful reminder for that. The other thing that came up yesterday is that we're heterogeneous. And the thing that we have to remember is the fact that we can't be put into a box like all the leaders tell us to do. They all approach us differently. And the fact that we come, we are so heterogeneous. It's the reality that we all have different and unique issues that need to be addressed and they need to be spelled out. That quit putting us in total box, but how do we basically really understand the different identities and what brings to the table and what different issues we may have? Yes, there are some that are very similar, but I think we're at a time now to be able to disaggregate that data, but also force our leaders to understand, don't put us in that one box, look at us in a different way and really celebrate the heritage that we bring to the table, I think is really a critical space. The last thing I'll say with that, with regards to that sort of piece as well, is the fact that, again, it behooves our leadership to really understand that, you know, we don't want to be a detriment. We want to be a help, not only to our institutions and moving forward, but I think also to the nation, because again, we have no choice. You know, as we, as if we're pre good predictors of the future, we have to change things. And if anything else that we know, we know the pandemic did us a favor. I hate saying that, but the reality is it shook the nation. It woke us up. And the reality, CDC was putting out this data, looking at the cases, the hospitalization rates and death rates and comparing, comparing it to the non-Hispanic whites. And it continues to today. And the reality is that it uncovered for somewhere it was invisible to them, the many inequities and the social injustices that happened to our patients and our communities as well. And we know this. I mean, it, it said, I, I, one of the phrases I've started hating day lately is it laid bare these inequities. Mm -hmm. And the reality is we've all known this. We've seen it in our family. Some of the experience that during the last two years where we lost family, family members, people in our community that we deeply cared for. And, there were, and even some of us that have been doing research in health inequities for it, ages where basically it felt like it just went out the window and nobody was really paying attention. But I think it's this rationale is that we really need, if we learned anything from the pandemic, is that we need people at the table who are going to focus, understand, and address the Latino community issues that are very unique, the health inequities and health disparities that they suffer from to improve the health of these communities and provide that focused research agenda. You know, I think we do bring a different perspective to the table. And that's a real critical notion that our non-Hispanic colleagues cannot and will not bring to the table. They've already demonstrated that. And so this is an important time to begin when we change our narrative. It's not just the philosophy, but we have to have data like this to provide to them so they have a better understanding of that. But when I look at this data, it begs the question, and maybe it's just me, you know, would these injustices have been as prevalent if we had more Latinx leaders in positions of power and of decision-making that would have influenced the health system? I don't want to pretend I know the answer to that. The other important point about this is that we're invisible. No matter how many people that we have had in these incredible positions, you know, I think about uh, just Joe Betancourt this morning. I think about uh, Emilio um, Perestable, you know, they're so invisible. Those of us are invisible, you know, to, to the society itself and to our academic leaders as well. I mean, we all know that adage, right? That we all grew up with, 
that whole notion that if I see it, I can be it, right? And so, but I chose four, I saw the blue <clears throat> uh, photos from four academic medical institutions and the Center for Photo of Art Council of Deans at the AAMC. Um, what I want to say to you, these are, the faith, these are the pictures that people see today. If I'm a student, I'm a resident or fellow, I'm an early career faculty, mid-career faculty, this is what we see. What's missing? Now, the obvious is that there's no Latino faces. There is no Latino faces. And, and trust me, there are private and public institutions that are also represented in these pictures as well. And so, and there's a stark absence, you know, across the academy of who's not there. And we're, we're invisible to society. And I think of anything else, if I hope that you hear my message is that we need to make ourselves much more visible. We need to be intentional about that. But I also have to beg the question too, you know, is this invisibility intentional? And if it is, that changes our approach, all right? So everybody looks at the data. As I promised you, I'm not gonna go through all the data, but there's a couple of things that are really important. You know, AAMC is collecting data for ages, so as ACGMA and so as AMA and their master file as well. But what's really become more and more obvious, we had lots of data that was shown yesterday, but the other thing is that we probably also notice what data we don't have that are really needed to make the case, right? So I think over the years, the WMC has done a pretty darn good job as far as the, the medical data that goes on there. Um, you can find out many things about our medical students, but then as you go down the list, we have some data regarding the faculty by race and ethnicity, some with residents that's going to be stronger at ACGME than us, but the ranking data is starting to appear. We only started collecting the data and revealing uh, the race and ethnicity of department chairs and deans over the, just the last several years, which you think we would have this trend over 40 years to be able to look at that. But I got to tell you today, we have little or no data on the following. You look at the leadership positions on center directors, residency program directors, department division heads, vice deans, senior associate deans, and the like, associate and assistant deans. Those are equally just as important to find out, you know, what role are we playing in that? Do we have a shortage in each of those areas, but we can't make the case unless we, have, we collect that data. And the last thing, you got to think about this. When I think about that, our Latino faculty that are participating in medical schools, the majority of them come from the first two bullet areas. They're either non-full-time faculty, they're part-time, or secondly, they're volunteer, but we never count them. The data we showed you yesterday and the data I'll show you today is only for full-time faculty members. And so we can walk away with a, aha, uh -huh. but we also need this other data to find out, you know, and more importantly, how can we support the volunteer faculty and the part-time faculty that are involved with this as well? So again, I'm not, I'm going to skip some of these slides with your permission because it was covered yesterday about how we are looking like with uh, enrollment and matriculation data for our students. So I don't want to belabor that. And for those of you who didn't attend yesterday, again, the uh, session yesterday with all the data was recorded. So um, I think they've done a really good job in taking a look at that. But I do want to fast forward us to um, this particular slide. This was a recent study that just came out from Zorali and his colleagues at Southwestern. But they took a lot of the data from the AAMC to really look at the full-time faculty in the clinical and basic science departments when we start looking at leadership. Just to walk you through the slide a little bit, this upper curve here, the gray triangles are a representative non-URN males who are clinical faculty, basic science faculty is on the slide to your right using the same legend. This particular graph here, uh, that's kind of a darker non-URM females both in the clinical and basic science. And then down below are our URM males and URM females. What do you see? It's the same trend that we see with our admissions, you know, to, to, our, to our students as well, URMs. When you look at the rise from 1979 through 2018, in which they look at of clinical full-time faculty and basic science faculty, huge slope of the curve. It's changed fourfold for clinical sciences and 1.8-fold for basic sciences. But at the bottom, still flatline. We don't see much of a budge in that area, despite even the growing numbers of faculty as well. And that's a trend that I think we need to also reverse as well. This is just kind of a blowdown. The only thing I want to highlight on this particular slide that you saw yesterday 
This is a medical school faculty, the most recent data that we have in, in 2021 with regards to this. The gray bars represent professors, the orange bar represents associate professors, and the blue bars associate assistant professors and stuff. What I want you to walk away with, because I'm going to address this in just a little bit, that is when you total up the number of faculty that we have right now, in 2020 at least, that mounts up to 5,391 LHS positive faculty. Now think about this for a second. Where are they? Why aren't they here? And this is not a dis only that is at all. It's just the point that if we're going to become a village, and if we're going to have a large voice, we need the rest of those faculty to also engage them. And we have to figure out some mechanism to engage them in ways that we haven't done as well. And even when you start looking at thinking about the leadership that can move the mountain sort of thing that really needs to help us, some of those that are tenured faculty uh, that are in the professorship position, we have 113 leaders that are chairs across the United States. We need them here as well because they have clout. They have voice. Most of them do. At their institutions, we need to pay attention to that. And, I, and that's not a slight difference. And again, I don't, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to concentrate on where we are with the deans, but let, let's just concentrate more about these challenges. And again, I don't, we could spend a whole week talking about all the challenges that are facing LHS faculty and others. But there's a couple of things that I really want to hit on really, really quickly today, and that is this. And I'll start with a quote. And this is from Maria Chavez. Uh, she is an associate professor in political science at Pacific and Lutheran University. Um, this is in Washington State, where I used to be. And she's an author of an excellent book called Everyday Injustice, Latino Professionals and Racism. If you have a chance to read it, please do. She basically did a study looking at lawyers, both in private practice and also those in law schools as well. And this is the most, this is the one that really resonated with me that I want you to take home with you. So we know that Latinos are racialized in this country when the most successful members of the Latino community, those who have done everything right, like us in this room, regularly experience discrimination. This paradoxically demonstrates how deep racism and discrimination runs in America, and I would say even in our own academy as well. But at the same time, the conundrum is this. Um, this is uh, Ra Raul Isaguire. Some of, uh, of us in this room um, have had the pleasure of um, working with him and knowing him. He's a past president and CEO of the National Council of La Raza and also the past U.S. ambassador of the Dominican Republic. This spoke to me as well because here's the battle. Amongst the racialization, I think many of us feel this way. And I'll just quote his quote is, I treasure who I am. I treasure who my parents were, my culture, my language. And I don't have to give any of that up in order to succeed. Indeed, if I keep all those things, it will make me more successful in practical terms as well as in self-fulfilling terms. Latinos have a unique con contribution to make in America. And we can't do that if we give up our cultural core that which makes us up of who we are. This is one of those things that I wanna to send to all my non-Hispanic leaders across the country and all the medical schools and teaching hospitals that we have. Do you understand this piece? Can you accept the fact how important cultural identity is for us as well? This is just another quote from uh, Dr. Um, from Kevin Johnson, who's the Dean of the School of Law at UC Davis, where, where I came from before I came to the AAMC, uh, and another Latino in a leadership position, and he says, uh, as he was interviewed by Marie Chavez, no Latino in America, whether a citizen or a professional, can truly escape the consequences of racialization that brand him or her as foreign, unwelcomed, and unwanted. Latinos are not allowed to assimilate. No amount of assimilation efforts on the part of Latinos can compete with the structural barriers and cultural constructions of what it means to be an American. I'm only sharing this because I'm not sharing this as a downer. But it's a message to us. The message to us is this, is I think, despite all the work that a lot of us in this room have spent years in trying to change the, the needle on this sort of thing, I think the next generation work that we need to think about, we need to think at systems level now. We need to be systems-based and transformative leaders to change the system. There's an, art, there's an author out there by the name of Mark Arsenault, and I love it because it really, really helps me focus. And he said wisely, the system isn't broken. It's working exactly as it was designed. And you gotta remember that. 
because I think we can no longer afford not to address the systemic problem that we have it, and we simply need to disrupt it. We can't disrupt it individually, but we can certainly disrupt it collectively, you know, juntos, as I would say. And so, again, what does executive leadership need to know? One of the things that we know about white privilege is that there is two luxuries, and this is written by Gary Howard, who has studied a lot uh, along what white privilege and what is white supremacy and what that does. And that's the luxury of ignorance and the luxury of denial. Because we've done our work. If you look at all the studies we've already done now of highlighting what are the challenges faced by, and this is a compilation of graduate students, medical students, residents, and faculty from historically excluded and underrepresented groups in STEM, we've had the data now. We have the solid data that continues to come out that brings out on the right-hand side all those things that make up toxic um, you know, workplaces and toxic learning environments as well. So again, I think it's going to really start from helping our leaders understand our unique and different challenges that we face that other non-URMs don't. Because I'm not sure that they really see that. You know, and again, is that intentional or non-intentional? But it's also time. How do we empower those of us that are in leadership positions, our tenured faculty that are Latinos, our tenured faculty that are our department chairs, to come together to also start catalyzing that voice who are usually listen? Because they must understand our lived experiences. And I mentioned before, the reality is it's different for each and every one of us. But our lived experiences is so critical. Our narratives of what we are challenged with is really important. Um, and then ultimately, it's not just complaining about this, but it's also how do we think about and be really forward thinking about coming up with some system-based solutions so they'll continue to pay attention as opposed to listening to the wrath of what we already know and what we keep telling them. So again, I'm going to leave you with several questions I think that are really important for us to begin thinking about from an individual level and from a group level. Um, and these are the questions that, that I challenge us with and I challenge myself with all the time. Well, my hope is that, you know, as you begin contemplating, you know, how can we, what part do we play? What part do you play? What part does a group play? What part does an institution play? It's just asking ourselves these questions, reflect on this together, because they're hard questions. And also it's going to call for truth, you know, and deep reflection. So number one, what holds us back? What holds us as Latino back? And I'll contend, we do have a system problem. We have a white social framework that influences our institution. If you don't know what a white social frame is, you know, I strongly recommend the works of uh, Dr. Joe Fagan, who's written on this for quite some time, that's basically embedded in our system that doesn't value rec recognize your cultural identity. We're not supposed to. In our white society, we're not supposed to value that at all. And the reality is, is as jo Dr. Joe Fagan also said, Latinos have been racialized as non-white and thus experienced discrimination in countless ways. And it's time that we address that system and also our counterframe to it in order to deconstruct this racialization that people are, are really talking about. You know, we have, an, we have an educational system within the academy that expects us to assimilate to this white social frame. How many times have I heard, hey, David, as long as you, as long as you go ahead and assimilate, you'll get promoted and you'll thrive. But if you don't, you're going to be marked and sometimes targeted um, at your institution as a difficult faculty member. But again, as I think about those of us that now are in the positions that we are, how much have we assimilated? But I think a lot of us, like um, Raul Asagiria said, is that, but a lot of us has also learned how to be culturally adaptive in the sense that we didn't have to give up my soul, didn't have to sell that soul, but at least how did we adapt, continue to be resilient and faced it up? And how, what did we use as far as our identity to kind of move that forward? I'm jumping ahead here. Um, you know, do we see ourselves in leadership positions? What does that look like? You know, do you possess a leadership identity? If I lined you all up and I asked you individually, what does that mean to you? Because what's important is that if you don't see it, then our executive leaderships aren't going to see that. And that becomes really important. You know, I even call the questions is that, do they really see us in leadership positions? Or do they follow the white social frame and saying, no, you know, that we're presumed incompetent, that we can't do this, and there's certain things that we can do, and they're fine at the assistant professor level, but there's nothing else beyond that. You know, again, the key thing is that how much are they aware of our cultural identity and how much that plays out? You know, does our cultural identity contribute to leadership attributes? What do you think? Do we see our cultural identity as an asset, or do we see it as a detriment? 
you know, truth be told, you know, when have you ever been taught that your Latino identity is an asset to being a doctor, to being a scientist, to being a leader in an administrative piece? That's a missing piece, I think, what we have, unless it comes from family, you know. But what about people outside of our family? How many times have you heard, you know, David, you should focus on, don't, don't, don't focus on your Latino identity because that interferes with your science identity. Uh, and if you really want to be a research scientist, you know, really focus on your science identity uh, and don't focus on this thing uh, called the Latino identity. Do we buy into that? Do we do I buy into the assimilation the thought process in that? And I challenge this because, again, sometimes we feel that we're at risk, that if I challenge that and say my cultural identity is important, we also feel that's going to come back uh, and, and taunt us uh, in jurisdiction. So what I'm going to leave you with is this. I, will, I would contend to you, I think we need to get back to some of our leadership principles that are deeply embedded in who we are as Latinos. You know, Juan Abortus wrote two excellent books out there, Sal Salsa, Soul, and Spirit, Leadership for a Multicultural Age, and The Power of Latino Leadership. And she contends that, you know, we lead differently. The predominant major group right now operates under the leadership style of hierarchy, very self-oriented, self-centric, very power-oriented as well, and very self-serving. But Latino leadership, she contends, is more egalitarian. You know, we're more community-centric, we are more culturally based, and we really believe in collective stewardship is what really moves the mountain sort of thing. And this is totally opposite from this, this hierarchical leadership that we face every day. But they also don't know about this egalitarian leadership style. And what's important, I'll make the case for you today, it is so in alignment of what we need today and tomorrow. We need transformational leadership. And if I just highlight some of these that are really important, um, you know, we all know these. These are our constructs, you know, our social constructs that make up who we are as Latinos. And you recognize some of these sorts of things. And when you start looking at things like personalismo, that we're, we operate as a leader, we believe in interconnectedness, we believe that everybody has inherent worth and value. When you think about things such as la cultura, that we operate under a cultural-based leadership, we keep that cultural balance always in our strategic planning and our problem solving. We don't exclude that and put that on the side. You know, we have a we orientation. We don't have an I orientation when we lead. You know, we believe the strength of heterogeneity. And we were kind of one of the first groups who really started talking about inclusiveness because we could bring everybody together. Juntos, there you see that word again. That we believe in co collective stewardship and community leaders that are sharing responsibility across the board. Si se puede, you heard earlier this morning, you know, come up that we believe in social activism, the perseverance and the commitment with each other to be, to be brokers, to basically in these um, um, partnerships as well. And I'll just make the case, why is this important to our leaders? Because this is about transformational leadership and they need to discover that we're right in front of them sort of thing. And so these are just the four domains of transformational leadership that have been espoused, but transformational leaders work with their people to implement change. They guide the change through inspiration and motivation. Their role models and their followers emulate their action. That's a definition of transformational. And they also inspire by motivating others to perform beyond expectations. And I make the case to you, I've put each of the leadership principles for Latinos above that because it really hits on every one of those particular domains that are really important. Uh, individual considerations. The first one is the extent to which a leader attends each follower's uh, needs. And that's personalismo and destino. Inspiration motivation is a degree to which a leader articulates an appealing vision that inspires and motivates. And that's fe de esperanza. It goes out of the la vida. We like to stir the salsa. You know, the salsa is not good until you stir up the jaderos that are in there, right? So get the essence of the spice and the hotness in it as, as goes on. The idealized influence describes leaders that are role models and engage in high standards of ethical behaviors. That's what La Cultura and Juntos has been about, and intellectual stimulation really brings in Cisa, Cisa Puede as well. So, let's look at opportunities really quickly and stuff that I think I'll just end the talk with this, and that is, the AAMC does a lot of things that, again, I was really surprised how many people don't know other things that, you know, I have to ask myself, for, you know, why aren't we doing the job to disseminate the information out there as well? And how can we do this in a much better way? I'm going to make the argument, I think we need to change the narrative. And that is, we need to be front and center. 
is say, we have another shortage that we've discovered. And this is where Lidieres comes in. And that shortage, we have a crisis in our LHS plus leaders. And we need to build the future if we're really going to impact this change and help you in that future. We need to really have that particular, understand the narrative and get that narrative across. I think it's important. You know, again, these are just many of the things we do. We have a leadership program to create ne uh, the next generation of chief diversity officers. We have a number of uh, particular programs that are leadership development programs um, that are specific for women, but also specific for all of our minority faculty, both early career and mid-career as well. We even have things like a grant writers coaching group to help you get these NIH awards, you know, to get on the docket of your, your KO1s and also your R25s as well. And we do this exceedingly well. As we talked about yesterday, we also have a dean's fellowship for our next uh, uh, deans uh, as well. But here's what's missing. Again, and now we can tend to you, what we need to do is there's lots of other programs that are out there and a lot of representatives that are going to be at this are here, like NHMA has done a lot of work in this area. But one of the problems is this. The numbers that we have are not big enough to get into these programs. And we're talking small numbers. And we need some way to expand it. But we also have to get beyond this whole thing that, you know, well, the AMA should be, I mean, the LAMC should be doing this. NHA should be doing this. The reality is it's going to take organized medicine, I believe, in these different societies to really basically collectively come together. And even ACOM coming together with us is saying, how do we expand this? Because, you know, one of the things that I think NHMA and the AAMC and others that are doing this, we know the template. We know what works. And the reality, how can we work with leaders to figure out what is this template that can be replicated at other associations of the societies that aren't doing this work that makes it a little bit easier for them to bring in this on board? And that's where I think we can have that discussion as well. But it also thinks about making new partnerships that we never think about. And that is, I just joined recently because I never knew it about it at all, is this National Association of Latino Healthcare Executives. Anybody in the room belong to that? Anybody in the room know about that? I was shocked by this. I mean, I was delighted when I saw it. But again, this is an organization, again, of, I think about Joe Betancourt's um, uh, talk this morning. These are a collection of Latino executive leaderships across all the United States hospitals and healthcare organizations who are experts in the field of healthcare policy and practice. They need to be at the table with us. They truly need to be at the table with us um, to also to inform us, but us to inform them about how can we play this out together because to build that village. The other people that's not, not, not on this slide that I would re recommend strongly thinking about is NADAHI, the National Association of uh, uh, Diversity Officers in Higher Education. I think that becomes really important. They need to be at the table. And then higher education has done a lot of this work as well. So let me summarize. A lot of information, but I want to summarize it for you again. We talked about those questions that I mentioned to you. And again, you'll have access to these slides, but I think the reflective questions for us as individuals start transforming that into action. What does that mean for us? And each of us are going to have different answers for that, but something really important. How do also do the 10 Latino leadership principles align with that leadership identity that you have? As a group, I think we have to come together and quit working in silos. You know, that's our history as we work separately. When you think about even a lot of the associations that are trying to do the same work, want the same thing, but we don't grab together. I mean, this is one of the biggest efforts of trying to do that. But again, there's many people that are not in the room um, that are basically part of this. And so using those same questions about as a group and reflecting with each other becomes really important. But I think the important piece is this collective power. You know, can we create a mechanism that enhances the engagement of people that aren't here? Those successful mid-career and senior Latino faculty um, that don't attend these type of meetings, but they should, Remember, I remind you, 5,391 LHS positive faculty that are there, and we have a small percentage that are involved in this work, and we should have a collective 5,000, my dream, a JP. I don't know if it's realistically, and I'm not even including ACOM, but I'm sure that, again, we could create this collective that would be a lot more powerful. But also, can we reach out to the academic societies as well? You know, we have a lot of Latinos that are leading some of these societies and all the specialty and subspecialists we need to tap them because they can be there for career consultation, mentorship, sponsorship, and things. You know, can we also create a mechanism that, you know, touches and bases on our community-based physicians who are in leadership positions, those that are leading medical societies, those that are leading some of these other societies, those that are part of their state's um, medical associations, 
you know, we need to tap them. We need chief medical officers. You know, there's a whole cadre of people that it's probably time that we now finally get together. And I would basically say it at the very end of this is that maybe we need a summit, you know, a two or three day summit where we bring all these leaders together to be able to do that as well. So again, I think we need to change that narrative, as I mentioned before, call for more complete data. And I think we need to just enhance those educational opportunities for our, our early career, mid-career faculty now who are future leaders, but also for our students as well. They need to see that we're doing this productively and move forward. The AAMC can basically help convene the top influencers in our medical schools, but that's still not enough. But we have that segue. We have we can we can touch those council of deans. The counts can touch those CEOs through our uh, council on teaching hospitals as well. People who are in these decision making and powerful places. We can take advantage and leverage our affinity groups as well, such as GDI, GFA, and the list goes on. The people that are made up of litters as well. Um, I think we need to demand from the AAMC and others. Let's make this. Let's make this data explicit let's make it accessible so we can see this as well um so thank you for listening um it will be definitely be around so we can have i'm looking forward to our discussion a little later today thank you.